1981, a nameless disease was discovered in the United States. This illness was highly feared but rarely understood. It was thought to be something that only affected gay people, drug addicts, and sex workers. The prejudice around these groups led to much stigma around this disease, and research for a treatment or a cure was held off for years because the people who were getting this disease were deemed as deserving of it. Only after more and more people were taken over by this virus did the American public understand for the first time that this could affect anybody and everybody. Since 1981, this disease has come to be known as human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. You all most likely know what HIV is, whether you heard about it in an awkward fifth grade health class like me, or um, you may know someone who's personally been affected by it. Today, we have highly effective treatment for HIV in the form of antiretrovirals, or drugs that prohibit the multiplication of cells infected with the virus, and the fact of undetectable equals untransmittable, meaning that if a person acquires HIV and the virus becomes undetectable in their body, it is completely um, untransmittable to another person. Uh, this virus still remains prevalent in the United States, uh, seeing as there are around 38,000 HIV infections and around 7,000 HIV deaths per year in America alone. Though these rates have greatly decreased since the beginning of the epidemic, there is one hidden obstacle that is keeping us from truly defeating this virus. This, is, this obstacle is the number of generalized epidemics of HIV in impoverished areas of the United States. A gen generalized epidemic is defined by UN AIDS as the prevalence of greater than 1% in the general population of these communities. So what that means is at least 1% of people in a number of impoverished communities are suffering in silence from a disease that has had a viable cure since the early 2000s. In a study done by Paul Denning and Elizabeth Deneno for the CDC, it was shown that prevalence rates of HIV in urban poverty areas were inversely related to annual household income. This shows that the lower, one, the lower one's income, the higher the prevalence rates of HIV. Now, as many of you know, HIV predominantly affects um, mostly gay and bisexual men. And the population that is very likely to live within these impoverished communities are young African-American gay and bisexual men. So not only does socioeconomic status contribute to one's inability to receive treatment or testing for HIV, but within these communities, homophobia and stigma around HIV does as well. This was shown in a study by George Ayala, which proved that when confronted with discrimination, financial hardship, and lack of social support, young African-American gay and bisexual men were more likely to participate in risky sexual behaviors. This could, because, could be because of the shame that they may feel if they were to be public with their identity, or because of simply the lack of education within these communities. All of these statistics go to show that HIV is still a major issue among impoverished communities in the US, but is overwhelmingly affecting young African-American gay and bisexual men within these communities. Now the question is, how do you solve an epidemic? Well, we must look at what works. First things first, we must educate these communities about risks associated with unsafe sexual practices, starting with sexual education in schools. Now, many want to believe that sexual education will simply encourage kids to have sex, therefore worsening things like prevalence of STDs. On the contrary, it has been proven that sexual education works. If young people are armed with information about their bodies and about risks that come with sexual behavior, they are less likely to engage in unsafe sexual intercourse and when they do engage in sex, they are more likely to use safe contraceptive methods to prevent unplanned pregnancy and STDs. So how would this education be provided? Well, schools should mandate sexual education on the grounds that it could very well be saving these children's lives. As we all know, not every child attends school and may not get this information from uh, their parents or they may receive incorrect information from their friends or siblings. 
Uh, so community centers that already promote a sense of unity uh, within these impoverished areas could provide programs to educate their populations of young people and about HIV and how to maintain a healthy sexual status. Young people in these communities must not only have information about healthy sexuality, but also access to means to be healthy when they choose to become sexually active. Free condom distributions are already a very common practice, but should be brought to the awareness of more young people. While sex ed and condom distribution seem like relatively simple and effective ways to quell high rates of HIV among impoverished young people and are an absolute necessity if this epidemic is to ever be solved, uh, the real problem that these people are facing is the lack of awareness that this is even occurring in our own country right under our noses. I believe that to truly solve this issue, we have to look back to the past. In the 1980s, when this whole thing began, grassroots activists began to fight for HIV research because of the sheer number of their friends, family members, and lovers that were dying each and every day without the majority of the United States even paying attention in the beginning. I feel like something very similar is happening today. Many Americans are unaware of the toll that HIV is taking on those living in, in, in poverty in the United States. So until this issue is brought to the light, it will remain rampant and cost many more lives in the coming years. In the 1980s, it took about 10 years to get any notice of the epidemic and any help from the FDA. And this generalized epidemic can only be helped by those who are willing to help themselves and fight for those who cannot fight. The same passion and anger that was found in the activists of the 1980s and 90s is needed in the activists of today because HIV and AIDS are not issues of the past. They are still among America's hidden, just like they were among America's hidden in the 1980s. This issue needs to be brought to national attention and we must demand action. The fire that was once lit underneath the protesters and organizers of yesterday must be found again amongst those of today because their passion worked. Through political protests and action, these people fought to save their own lives in a time where very little was known about this disease, but they were able to promote the FDA to test and approve life-saving drugs. With all the information known today, combined with a call to action from the American people, Less would die from a disease that we thought was no longer a big issue. And I bet you're all wondering, how does this apply to me? Why should I care? Well, since today we are talking about young people, we have to understand that this is an issue that young people are currently dealing with. Considering young people account for more than half of new HIV infections around the globe, meaning that this could affect you, your brother, your sister, or your child. So, I, so what I ask of you today is to be informed, but to also be compassionate. We, as the next generation, have the ability to change injustice, and I think we can all agree that it is an absolute injustice to let this continue. I hope that we keep our minds open and we continue to fight for, if not support, the efforts to stop this epidemic in its tracks and to refuse to let it passively progress. What I leave you with is a quote from AIDS research activist Bob Rafsky. Act up, fight back. Thank you.